Hey, what's up? It's Justine Buick, the NCLEX Tutor, and I am back to uh, go over some of these who do you see first types of NCLEX questions. So these are really common questions on the NCLEX and uh, you really want to know how to answer them and there's a certain way to answering them. However, you have to have a good knowledge of content or it's really hard. So that's why it's important to go through all the different systems and know what immediate complications are. Are you able to recognize those immediate complications? And so something that I did for my students when I was writing my book, the Nugget Pages, the NCLEX Nursing Nugget Pages, as I added the section called, Who Do You See First? And um, I put in here what immediate complications are because a lot of people couldn't recognize them or couldn't say what they were. All right, so we're gonna go try some of these questions. So they're uh, worded like this, who do you see first or who do you assess first? Who do you call back first? Who warrants immediate intervention? I'm sure there's a few other ways that they could say it, but it's basically all the same thing. Okay, like who's the most unstable or who's the most critical? And that's a really important skill to be able to do on the NCLEX and in the real world of nursing. Is your patient having an immediate complication that you need to be worried about right now or can it wait? You will do that all the time as a nurse. All right, so I'm gonna give you a minute. You can press pause and uh, or stop the video and try to do this question and try to get an answer and I will go over it afterwards. All right, so you're probably back now and hopefully you press pause. So when I read this question, I will see that it says I'm on a med surge unit. So I see that right away. I like to know where I am and that I just received the morning report and uh, now it says, who should I go see first? So clearly I'm looking for somebody who's critical. So I'll go through them and try to decide are they stable or unstable? And sometimes I don't know, I'm just gonna have to question it. And I just wanna point out, this is kind of funny, like if somebody gave you a report like this, like this little amount of information in the real world, like they would have their license be at risk because this is not very good practice to give like the most small amount of information for each patient. I mean, this is definitely not real world. You would have way more information after a report. But anyway, this is the NCLEX, this is what we do. So you gotta know how to answer these questions. So as you read each one, this is what I do. They're typically gonna give you a condition and then they're going to give you the sign and symptom data. So you have to look at that sign and symptom data and start interpreting it as being normal for this situation or abnormal, or you'll hear people say expected or unexpected. So things that are unexpected of their condition are more likely to be the answer because something is wrong. And also you can look to see which symptoms are more severe. So sometimes you have symptoms that just sound very mild and uh, they're probably not going to be the right answer. You wanna look for things that are more severe. Also, you'll be able to point out things if there's a change in their condition or if you, you can tell that the treatment is not working. And uh, so that's all by looking at like the sinus symptom data. Sometimes that's really hard. Even that is like, oh, it's not really working. So uh, I will look at these answer choices and I'll say, well, who is the highest risk then of having a complication? If I can't really point out the one that's having the, the immediate complication, who would be the highest risk? So chronic kidney disease, they're scheduled for hemodialysis. All right, so right away I'm thinking, well, that's the treatment for chronic kidney disease, so that sounds pretty good. And it says their creatinine is 9.2. So I'm like, okay, what's normal creatinine again as soon as you see a lab? And uh, I'm pretty sure, what is it, 0 0.6 to 1.2, right? And BUN is like 5 to 20. All right, so this is really high. Well, that's kind of normal for chronic kidney disease. So that's expected. I know that they're going for hemodialysis soon, so I probably should see them. However, I am not seeing any uh, things that are unexpected or anything that's too severe for their situation. So I'm gonna call this person stable, but I'm not totally positive because you really have to compare your answers. This client has a GI bleed. All right, fine. And they're receiving a unit of packed red blood cells. All right, so they're in the midst of getting their packed red blood cells. Can you please tell me anything else? No? All right, well, 
they're not giving me any sign of symptom data to tell me that they're unstable, so I don't wanna start assuming that. However, you do know that when someone's getting blood products, there is a higher risk for complications. So I'm just gonna question this one. I mean, they sound pretty stable, but I'm not really sure what's going on exactly, and there is a high risk. So I'm actually gonna keep that one and compared to number one, I'm probably gonna just get rid of them because I don't see anything that's too severe with them. Client with ulcerative colitis exacerbation. So, you know, we're definitely getting a variety of things here. They have a GI disorder exacerbation and now their temp is 101, 38.3. So it's a little high and they're having abdominal cramping. All right, is that normal for this situation? Is it severe? Well, I don't know, those symptoms are pretty expected. I'm probably not gonna be run into the room for them. You know, I am concerned about them going septic with getting a temperature, but it's not super high. And I would call those like moderate symptoms. So uh, compared to number two, I'm probably gonna keep two and get rid of three because that these symptoms are expected. And I don't know what's going on with number two exactly. All right, this patient has AFib, so now a cardiac disorder. They're on telemetry, which is usually what they're on. They have warfarin, so it would be pretty nice to know what that medication is for. It's an anticoagulant. And now they're giving me this lab value. The INR is 3.2. So then you have to know labs, right? So labs are a basic fundamentals topic. And if you know what therapeutic INR is when someone's on warfarin, it's between two and three. So we're a little bit on the high side, but it's not critical high. And uh, so I'm probably not gonna be super concerned with that person. I don't see anything severe. I don't see anything too unexpected. So I'll probably get rid of that. So, you know, based on these three things, it's really hard to pick an answer, but knowing that if there's an increased risk, I'm probably gonna go with Number two, all right, so if you have a different answer, let me know, okay? But that's what I would go with, increased risk of complications from having a blood transfusion. And I'm just gonna go look at my nugget pages real quick. This is the uh, blood chapter. It's actually just one page. That's all I did for blood. I don't think you need to do more than that to know what you need to know as a nurse. And as you can see here, I put a little skull and crossbones and then it says, if there's a reaction, so we know that that is a really big deal and you wanna be concerned about reactions and because there is a high risk for that, that would definitely be a big contender in an answer if someone's getting a blood transfusion. All right, moving on to the next one. I'll give you a minute to try to get your answer and then I will tell you how I would answer it. All right, hopefully you're back and the triage nurse receives four telephone messages. Who should the nurse call back first? So same concept, stable or unstable. Get used to doing this every single time. Like get into a habit of answering them the same way every time so that it just becomes natural. And um, you still gotta think about it, but you kind of eliminate all these unknowns on how to answer it if you sort of, if you have a, uh, a habit of doing it the same way every time expected or unexpected, look for things that are more severe, if there's been a change for the worst, you can tell the treatment is not working, okay? And then the last thing I always think of is the increased risk of complications. All right, a 66 year old male, so I do pay attention to age and sex. It may not make a difference in the answer, but I do like to pay attention to that just in case. They have peripheral vascular disease. So here is the condition. You have to know what those conditions are. And now the symptoms are acute onset abdominal pain radiating to the low back. Ooh, is that a normal symptom for that condition? And um, you may or may not know, but if something says acute, I don't like that word. So acute onset something, sudden onset something. There's some other terms that they use such as, let me see here, abrupt, increased. Those kinds of words, I'm always like, ooh, what's wrong with this person? So I'm not sure what this is. So I'm just gonna question it for right now. Let me look at the other ones. Cause I don't think that's a normal symptom of peripheral vascular disease. A 28 year old female who fell on ice yesterday and has low back pain and spasm. All right, so is that expected or unexpected? Totally expected. Would that be considered a severe symptom of like a major complication? No, it's not. It's a musculoskeletal issue and I'm not so sure that that's like such a big deal. Uh, for immediate complications. So I'm gonna call that expected. 
and I'm gonna say they're more stable okay because as soon as and by the way you know I'm thinking number one cardiac issues Ooh, are they having a heart attack like what's going on so I'm gonna get rid of that one 42 year old male client who developed sharp burning leg pain all right so leg pain radiating from the buttock to the knee after lifting heavy weights all right so here we are with another musculoskeletal issue is this one of those big musculoskeletal complications and if you're able to interpret sign and symptom data which you are supposed to do be able to do i know that's sciatica so that's another musculoskeletal issue not a big deal it is expected i don't see um that as severe i see that as something you know severe for them for pain but moderately or mild when it comes to um, immediate complications. So I'm gonna say that person's technically stable. A 70 year old female, 10 days, so it's been 10 days, they had a um, spinal fusion. And some people actually stop at that point and they go 10 days, no, oh, they're fine. I say, you have to look at the sign and symptom data. Like, don't skip over that. So many people skip over the sign and symptom data. Like, how are you supposed to know what's wrong with your patient if you don't look at that, right? So, increased persistent back pain. So, it's increasing. That's not great. It's changing. And a fever of 101.2, 38.4. Uh-oh. What's happening with this person? So, how do you interpret it? I interpret it as an infection. And so, uh, that's not good. That's unexpected. All right, who's worse, one or four? What do you guys have? So if I have to choose between these two, I have to figure out who's gonna die first, right? Who's having the immediate complication? And sometimes that's hard for people to um, point that out. When I look at the acute onset of abdominal pain radiating to the lower back, I am gonna think, I wonder if they're having an MI because I don't think that's expected. So that's unexpected also. And I know that MIs are more deadly than someone having an infection. So I'm gonna go with number one. And when I look at these, who do you see first things? Remember, um, I said, unconscious is bad. Here's your airway and breathing. Here's your circulatory. And then infections are super important, but you know, they're at the bottom. So they're less likely to die in, of an infection right now than a heart attack. So here's the MI. So be familiar with symptoms of an MI, all right? All right, let's try this one and I'll give you a minute to try to figure out the answer. All right, so I'm back and several clients check into the emergency department at the same time. Okay, so now we're in the emergency department. I'd like to know where I am. The emergency department is not a very stable place, right? Typically people come in because there's big problems. So it's gonna be kind of hard. So which client should be seen first? So stable or unstable, all right? We think of the same thing over and over. Expected versus unexpected and severe, et cetera. All right, a seven month old. All right, so we got a baby. Persistent vomiting and diarrhea for several days. Okay, so is that expected or unexpected? Well, they didn't tell me like what condition they have. So, is it normal for a baby to be vomiting and you know having diarrhea for several days? No, that's not normal. So just off the bat, I know those symptoms are unexpected. And let's interpret them. Like what's the worst thing that could happen with that? Dehydration, that's not good. Because as soon as you get dehydration, you get electrolyte imbalances, your body needs fluids and electrolytes to function correctly. So big concern with that one. Let's pick that one. I'm going to call them unstable. A five-year-old, so a little kid, foreign body in the right nares. So they have something stuck up one of their nose uh, holes. Not good. Obviously, that's unexpected. I mean, so you have to think, all right, is this an airway and breathing problem? Are they giving you symptoms of them not being able to breathe okay? No. And just because one knows or one nostril is clogged does not make someone unable to breathe. So I actually think I like number one better because I feel like I'm going to have to probably start IV fluids on this person, make sure they're not going to get too dehydrated. So comparatively, I'm going to go with number one. All right. So number three, a seven year old little kid was restless. So there's some sign of symptom data after a tonsillectomy surgery three days ago. So some people see three days ago and go, eh, they're fine. Look at the sign and symptom data. It says they're restless. 
So that is a total key word. If you see that word, especially after some kind of respiratory or um, airway, breathing, uh, surgery, mouth surgery, you should be concerned. All right, so I do not like that word, restless. I'm going to keep that over number one. So even though if I say expected or unexpected, severe, like that may not help you so much. Like you need to know what are those key words that I need to be familiar with. And I'm telling you, restless is one of them. So uh, let me see what other word, what other keywords should you be familiar with? Confusion, increased confusion. That's, that's always a horrible one. Agitation, increased agitation, agitation irritability those are all signs of um, if they're not getting enough oxygen especially when you see it with the words before it like sudden irritation or agitation abrupt increased Okay, those are never good signs, so I like number three better. A nine-year-old with a second-degree burn to the arm who is crying unconsolably. Okay, so it hurts, there's pain. They're not going to die yet, so I know number three is definitely going to be the answer. So let me know if you thought of a different answer and why you would choose that one. All right, so let's do this one, and I'll give you a minute to do it. All right, here we are. After the nurse receives the change of shift report, who should the client or who should the nurse assess first? It gave us nothing. Where are we? Nothing just after the, the very small shift report. Terrible anyway, but this is all we have. A client with heart failure, there's the condition, who is short of breath, all right, I don't like that, um, and coughing up pink frothy sputum. So is that expected or unexpected of heart failure? It actually can be expected of left-sided heart failure, right? Because we're thinking about those expected versus unexpected. But then remember, you're looking for things that are more severe. So even if something is expected of a situation, you need to be able to recognize if it's a severe symptom or complication. So I'm going to interpret this as their lungs are filling up with fluid. Not good. Client with diabetes and a stasis leg ulcer okay do diabetics get leg ulcers yes they do saturated with serosanguineous drainage oh it's saturated with this type of drainage so they're giving you these kind of descriptor words which i say you should always pay attention to too. So what is serosanguineous? Some people think that's a sign of infection. Well, they have a knowledge deficit. It's not. It's like a pinkish color drainage. Totally expected. It is not a severe, I would call that a mild to mild issue. Okay. When it comes to your, their life being at risk. Okay. So no client with a left pleural effusion. So do you know what that is? It's one fluid kind of starts to get into the lungs. Not great. And then absent breath sounds on the, in the left base. So uh, is that expected or unexpected? Those are typical symptoms of a left pearl, pleural effusion. Not good that there's no breath sounds. I would probably want to go see that person, but who's going to die first between one and three? I hope you said one. Yes, this is, this is horrible. Okay. This is like the worst. All right. Climb with asthma. So now we have another airway issue. So let's look at it. Shorter breath. Don't like that. And high pitched expiratory wheezing. Oh my gosh. So like now their throat, their uh, bronchioles are kind of closing up on them. And um, it's when they breathe out. I do not like that one either. So you just have to know who is the worst one here. And that's really hard if, um, if you just go ABC. I mean, that's like the most bare minimum strategy I've ever heard of. It's not great to just go ABCs when you have multiple airway issues. So you have to have more detail, more knowledge about immediate complications in order to answer these. And the NCLEX is only going to get a little bit more harder and more complicated as in the future as patients get more complicated. So that's why I wrote the nugget pages. So your answer is number one. So when we look at these airway issues, you can see I wrote here pulmonary edema from fluid volume overload. So that would be from left-sided heart failure. I did not write what the symptoms are. So you would want to go into the respiratory nugget pages and go read up about what those immediate complications are. All right, here's the last one. And I'll give you a minute to try to answer this question. All right, hopefully you got it. The nurse has just received shift report 
which client should the nurse or which client should be seen first of course we're doing that whole stable or unstable thing and um, the expected versus unexpected right things that are severe um, there's been a change in their condition treatment not working who's the highest risk all right, these are all your like immediate complication kinds of things you're looking for. So client one day, so it's been one day after their triple A repair. All right, so let's go, um, you know, that's an abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. So cardiac issue. And now the symptom says they have hypoactive bowel sounds in all four quadrants. So is that, is that expected or unexpected? And is that severe? Well, I'm going to say that after a surgery where they're in this abdominal area, it's pretty normal to have hypoactive bowel sounds. Um, I'm not super concerned about that. It's pretty mild. So probably not the answer. They sound pretty stable. All right, client with a DVT who is up to use the bathroom for the second time. All right, so they gave us a DVT. You know that's a blood clot in the leg and uh, go are they allowed to be getting up to go to the bathroom do they need to be on bed rest um they're not really giving me any sign and symptom data to tell me that they're having an immediate complication and remember what are you worried about with the dvt that's going to break loose and call a pulmonary embolism so uh, there is a risk for that happening and um you know if they're moving around a lot sure that could probably be more likely to happen so i'm just gonna you know question mark that one that could be an answer i like that one better than number one client with raynaud's phenomenon do you guys remember what that is who reports throbbing tingling and swelling of fingers in both hands all right so um is that expected or unexpected those symptoms of raynaud's it is expected i don't think they're going to lose their hand because of those symptoms so i would probably call that more moderate um, symptoms as in like mm, there, there's nothing really is gonna happen bad to them you know like losing their 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 hand all right so I'm probably gonna get rid of that one no client two days post-op below the knee amputation so it's been two days that amputation who reports here we go side of symptom data same leg foot pain as seven on the pain scale all right so they're having pain so I'm gonna say that that is expected right to have a bunch of pain after somebody got their um, leg amputated so do i pick number two well i'm looking at that oh, they're really not telling me any symptoms that they're having a complication from the dvt i know my content for what a person with dvt is allowed to do and it used to be they had to be on bed rest now they say no they actually can get up they're allowed to use the bathroom there's nothing wrong with that and didn't really show that they would uh, break loose a clot so uh, I'm gonna get rid of all of them oh which one do I choose so there's sort of like a hierarchy of who do you see first your immediate complications and who is the highest risk of complications and if you can't find anyone that's like that and you're like oh, everyone seems okay the second thing that I would look for are people who are in pain I've heard people say oh pain it's psychosocial it's not psychosocial pain is like pain hurts it's real it's physical pain it's not going to kill them but it doesn't feel good so that's something that you would want to look at if you can't find an immediate complication the third thing then I do look for are your psych patients who are like crying and upset and you know I wouldn't, um, a psych patient who wants to go kill someone or themselves, though, that would be a priority. That would be up at the top. But people who are like crying and upset, you know, about something, eh, they can wait. They'll be fine. And then the fourth thing is everyone who is fine. So everyone who's stable, they're having expected mild symptoms. You go see those people last. So if you ever had to put those in order, those are the things that I would be looking for. So who am I going to choose? Well, I can't find anyone who's uh, having a complication right now. And I know that this person's having some moderate to severe pain. So I'm actually going to go see number four is my first one. And that's correct. That's the right answer. All right. So I hope that was helpful for you guys. Um, if you want to see my book, you can go to my website, theanclextutor.com, where I also offer private tutoring webinars at my flashcards. And um, come check me out. All right. Thanks.